Here we go. Okay. Um, yeah, so thank you all for having me. And tonight I want to talk to you about um, Roseate Spoonbill Trends in Florida Bay and what the Everglades Science Center is doing to try and understand these birds a little better. So to start with here, I have a map of South Florida. Um, we have Lake Okeechobee up here at the top. You can see Loxahatchee. And out down here, outlined in red, is uh, uh, Everglades National Park. Um, not to say this is the entirety of the Everglades ecosystem. We know the greater Everglades actually starts at the Kissimmee River, north of uh, Lake Okeechobee, and water flows south all the way down into this subtropical estuary known as Florida Bay. And that's where the Everglades Science Center does a lot of its work. So if we zoom in a little bit to look at uh, Florida Bay specifically, uh, you can see that it is full of small islands connected by banks. Um, also, I'll refer to them as keys as well, probably more commonly. And uh, the water in uh, Florida Bay ranges from salty to brackish, depending on the time of year and where you are in the bay. And so the Everglades Science Center is located where this blue star is, roughly. Um, and so you're really ideally placed to work in the bay um, where we are. So uh, I do wanna show you these islands are very diverse. Um, they look very different. There's over a hundred different islands in Florida Bay. So I wanna show you some pictures of what these islands can look like to give you an idea of the diversity. So on some islands, you may have um, big salt pans like this with salt prairie. Um, these were currently, or in this, these photos, these were flooded from rainfall, but these salt pans do dry out. So some islands look a bit like this. Um, other islands, you might have this beautiful mix of um, dense red and black mangrove like you see on the left with these uh, uh, channels that you can sometimes kayak into and just beautiful light filtering through. Other islands, you, you break through this vegetation barrier and you come into an area of dead mangrove and mud and some water. And it's really interesting, just all the different things you can see out there. And um, occasionally we have just giant red mangroves. Um, the scale isn't very well portrayed in this photo on the right, but um, with this dense mat of roots um, that can be fun or not fun, to, to walk through. And other keys have big beds of cactus that um, you have to work your way through that um, even some of the birds, like these are great white heron chicks here. Uh, so some of the birds will even utilize that for nesting. And lastly, um, a lot of these keys actually have interior ponds. So big open areas of water in the middle of these keys. Uh, and so this is something I am gonna focus on some today and is actually really important. So now that you know a little bit more about what, about Florida Bay um, and what the keys are like in that, in Florida Bay, I wanna talk to you about what the Everglades Science Center actually does. Uh, so we do monitor Florida Bay as a means to determine how effective Everglades restoration is by studying four primary subject areas. The first being roseate spoonbill nesting and movement. Um, we also look at prey-based fish, submerged aquatic vegetation or SAV, I'll use those terms interchangeably, and the hydrology in um, roseate spoonbill foraging habitat. And when I say hydrology here, I'm not talking about the um, whether there are contaminants in the water or anything. We're, we're measuring depth, flow, uh, salinity, temperature, for example. Uh, so these four topics really allow us to study each level of the food chain in Florida Bay and also the entirety of the ecosystem. So we monitor these fish uh, that are preyed on by spoonbills in historic and present uh, foraging areas. And we also monitor the health of uh, 
be it SAV beds or submerged aquatic vegetation beds near those historic foraging areas. So these are areas that the prey fish use as nurseries. They use this vegetation. And then we also monitor the hydrology of those sites um, using what we call hydrostations. Uh, because as you all have probably heard said, water is life in the Everglades ecosystem. So all of these topics, the fish, the vegetation, the water, really determine roseate spoonbill nesting and movement and where they forage. And this is what I really want to concentrate on with you all this evening. So I'm sure you all are very familiar with roseate spoonbills, but I'll just go briefly into a little bit of their biology. Um, they are a large-bodied flamboyant wading bird with a spatulate bill. And they feed primarily in um, shallow waters and they're tactile foragers. Um, so they are feeling for their food. And they prefer water about 20 centimeters or less. So that's about eight inches. And that has to do with the length of their bill. Uh, they'll be found foraging in salt, fresh or brackish water on small demersal fish and uh, aquatic invertebrates. And they're found in wetlands throughout the tropics and subtropics where they breed. So I will note, um, you can see from this range map, wintering range through, um, for some birds, go to Central America to winter. Uh, and they primarily do associate with other wading birds. They are a tree nesting and roosting species. And um, they were nearly extirpated from Florida in the early 1900s by the millinery trade. So what is also called uh, hat making or the plume trade. But uh, they are now considered to be a species globally, a species of least concern. So that might bring up the question, then why spoonbills if they're a species of least concern? Why are they so important? Uh, well, let's think back to them being nearly extirpated from Florida. And that we've also found out they're an indicator species for Everglades restoration efforts and overall Florida Bay health. They're very tied to their environment so they're a great way for us to know how well that environment is doing and how well restoration efforts are working. And in Florida, they are still a state designated threatened species. They may be globally a species of least concern, but in Florida, we're still very concerned about them. Um, and the Everglades Science Center has actually been monitoring spoonbills for over 70 years now. And you may ask then, well, what does that monitoring look like? Well, um, we do nest monitoring primarily and methods have changed throughout the years. But um, generally this runs from November to May that we're out checking nests in the field. Um, and we check most keys, uh, about 60% of the keys in Florida Bay. So that's 60, 65 keys a season um, that we're, checking for nesting about one time per month. And once we do find nests at a colony, uh, we check those nests every seven to 10 days using a mirror pole. So that's um, literally a small mirror that we've mounted on an extendable pole so we can reach up to the nest and look in. Or we use an industrial endoscope attached to that pole. And or if they're not too high, we may use tree climbing. Um, so we always record the number of eggs, um, the chick, number of chicks, and the relative age of the chicks. And we generally end monitoring after a nest, uh, nestlings have reached 21 days of age or a nest has failed. Um, so we do recognize 21 days of age is not the time at which spoonbills are fledged, but they become highly peripatetic at this time since they're moving around a lot. We're not able to assign them to their nests anymore. Um, and so we consider 21 days of age a pretty good indicator of whether a nest has been successful or not, um, if they make it to that age. Spoonbills do fully fledge by 42 to 50 days of age, so six to seven weeks old. And so 
you're saying, okay, so you've been doing this for 70 years. What does the data look like then? Uh, well, a little something like this. Uh, so here we have a graph of the total number of nests uh, from 1935 to 2022 in Florida Bay. So on the x-axis, I have years and um, spoonbill breeding does take place from November to May. So years are, for example, 62, 63, uh, 64, 65. We have to, because it's split over two years. Um, and then on the y-axis, we have the total number of nests observed. Uh, for some years, we do have missing data. It's a fairly complete data set, but occasionally data wasn't collected. For example, during World War II, data was not collected during that war. So uh, for the most part, pretty complete data set. I do want to point out on this graph a couple of important points in time, because right now it probably looks like a bunch of craggy peaks, basically. Um, I'll note first that the abolishment of the hunting of wading birds for the millinery trade, so plume hunting, occurred in the early 1900s, which is great news for all wading birds, but especially if you were pink. Um, by 1935, which was when we started our monitoring though, uh, spoonbills had not recovered. And there were only 12 nests found. So that's extremely small number of nests. Uh, after 1935, we do see a gradual sort of increase happening until we reach a high point in um, 1978, 1979 nesting season, where they documented 1,258 nests. Following this, we do see a pretty distinct downward trend overall. The current 10-year average, um, on average, the number of nests is about 245 nests. Though I will note in the 22-23 season, we only documented 153 nests in Florida Bay. And so I do wanna come back to why we might be seeing this downward trend um, a little later, but I wanna highlight a few other projects we're working on with Spoon Hills in our office that are pretty exciting. And we'll tie into all of this. Uh, so one of the first other projects that we're doing here at the Everglades Science Center is we're using game cameras, like this one on the left, uh, to monitor spoonbill nests and nesting success. So here's our spoonbill nest over here as the little eggs poking out. Uh, and so this, this does involve climbing trees to put these cameras up there, but it, it's totally worth it with what we've learned. Um, and the idea behind, you may think, well, isn't climbing up in the trees really bad? Like, why would you climb up there when there's nests up there? Well, we do have a good reason for this. We want to decrease the amount of disturbance. So our monitoring is usually every seven to 10 days. We're experimenting with the idea of putting out cameras to monitor a nest state. So we can put out a camera at the egg stage and leave it up until a colony has completely finished. So we shouldn't have to go back. Um, and then just review the photos to find out if this nest was successful or not. So we'd be decreasing disturbance and decreasing the amount of time spent in colonies. Um, so uh, we've been doing this for about three seasons now, experimenting with and um, troubleshooting ways to get this to really work for us. And, we've learned that these nest cameras are not just great for telling us information about the survival of the nest. They're also allowing us to start asking a lot of additional questions that we're excited about. So for example, um, we're able to ask about predation, not to suggest that bald eagles are the primary predator of roseate spoonbills, but we can begin to ask that question, what does predate roseate spoonbill nests? What is the most common predator? At what nest stage or chick age are, uh, is it most common for them to be predated? Additionally, we can ask a lot of questions about um, uh, parental care. So we can ask things about such as, does one parent spend more time incubating than the other? Uh, 
does one parent spend more time with the nestlings than the other? Also, uh, frequency of feeding events, like we're seeing here with these uh, older chicks. Uh, how often are parents feeding? So there's just a lot of questions that we've realized can be answered with these cameras beyond just was a nest successful or not. So they've really wowed us kind of. Additionally, project I'm really excited about is that we're actively catching and putting cellular transmitters on adult spoonbills. So what we use to do this is a CO2 powered net gun and mist nets. So actually in the background of this picture, you can see some of our mist nets up um, and also our decoys, which yes, are lawn flamingos. Um, and this may sound pretty simple. Oh, a net gun, mist nets, like, yeah, okay, standard ways to catch birds. This is not. Um, it's a very time and staff intensive process, but it's, it's very rewarding. Uh, at a pretty low capture rate. But besides the point, um, we're putting transmitters on spoonbills uh, to help us understand their changing behavior because we notice they are changing what they're doing. Uh, their numbers in Florida are decreasing. They are utilizing different areas. And uh, we've been able to learn a ton from early transmitter data already. So uh, I want to draw your attention to this map here on the right from a bird named Duncan. So it was actually named by a donor. And I believe this was December 2021. Uh, and what this bird showed us was that he was nesting in here. This is an area that we had not checked before, not had, had not noted spoonbills in. It was actually quite secretive. Um, and so we were able to go in because this bird had a transmitter on and locate this colony. And it's a new colony to us. So now we add it to our roster every season to check. And we were also able to see, okay, this bird is nesting in here and he's foraging nearby on this key right here for the most part. So there's a lot of really great information available to us. And so our hope with these transmitters are that these birds will show us more nest sites that we didn't know about or non-breeding refugia that they're using, uh, new foraging sites we might not know about. Um, so along the same vein, we've recently uh, branched into using advanced modeling techniques with our transmitter data uh, to help us identify potential nest sites and foraging sites while breeding. Uh, so for example, if we look at this map here on the left, these are all the points for a single bird uh, from November to May. Uh, so that's seven months, that's a lot of data. How do you kind of pick through that? Well, that's where we turn to a program that allows us to pick out based on frequency of a bird's use of an area, um, where are they most likely nested and um, takes into their count their behavior. So there we go. Sorry, technical difficulties. Uh, in this yellow circle, this program told us, okay, this, this is the area and time period when nesting was most likely occurring. So we took that and we kind of parsed it out. And so the program told us a nest roughly here. And these black dots are all other usage. And that's great knowing, okay, the nest was here. Uh, these are other areas used by the bird. But what about, what if that, that doesn't really tell us about how much the bird was using different areas or how reliant it was on different areas. And so that's where we turn to another advanced modeling technique that actually looks at space use through time and gives us a sort of um, almost a heat map to look at. So the dark red is, uh, the areas where the bird nested, and then the lighter colors are space used by this bird. So this bird, it looks like primarily spent its uh, time at the colony, potentially had a nest uh, a foraging site near the colony. In the lighter blue are areas also utilized by the bird for foraging most likely. But you can see that um, that really narrows it down from this huge amount of points we had over here, or this 
even larger amount of points for seven months of data. So this has been a great tool, and I, I want to show you data from another bird as well. Uh, so this bird uh, nested here, and we can see some space use uh, pretty varied throughout the bay. You would think, okay, here and here where we have the densest black dots, uh, that must be where the bird spent most of its time. Well, our models tell us otherwise, actually, that this bird Yes, it nested here, um, identified that, but there was a lot more gradation and variation in space use through time. Um, and so this area here still comes out as a hot spot of foraging activity. But while nesting, this bird used a lot of different keys throughout Florida Bay. So that's really interesting just to see the individual variation in our birds. Um, so now I do want to come back to uh, sort of the future of roseate spoonbills, well, the present and the future of roseate spoonbills in Florida Bay. So I brought this graph back up. And um, this time I want to point out a different date. And that's about 2011. And 2011 is when we started to see uh, the effects of sea level rise in the key in the, the Florida Keys, so um, as documented by the Key West Harbor Tide Station. And so this has some really big effects on spoonbills. If we look at a little more closely at sea level rise data for the Keys, um, this is a uh, graph for sea le mean sea level uh, in meters on the y-axis and on the x-axis we have years, so starting in 2000 and going all the way to 2022. And uh, so this is just telling us what the water's doing and so mean sea level. Uh, so, and this red trend line is uh, kind of just the summation of what you're seeing. And basically uh, from 2000 to 2022, so um, in 22 years, we saw 15 centimeters or half a foot increase in mean sea level from the Gulf of Mexico in the Key West uh, Harbor Tide Station. So that's that's huge. Um, that's a huge increase in uh, water depth. And this has a direct impact on roseate spoonbill foraging. Higher water makes food harder to acquire. And then also remember spoonbill bills are only so long. They can only forage in uh, up to 20 centimeters of water. But Key West is really far away from Florida Bay actually. It's like two hours, two and a half hour drive. So we can't quite rely on just the data from the Key West Harbor Tide Station. We have to look at this through another lens because Florida Bay is a different ecosystem entirely. It's made up of basins. Um, it has seasonal water effects and uh, there is no tide station in Florida Bay. Instead, uh, we look at information on water levels using what we call hydro stations. So these measure the water depth the salinity, the temperature, for example. And our office has actually put out uh, 13 hydro stations, so indicated by these uh, red triangles, in the mangrove coastal zone of Florida Bay. So they're measuring uh, water that's come from further north as it's flowed down and it's entering Florida Bay. So they're measuring the water levels in that area. Um, so these uh, have been, these are in sites where roseate spoonbills have traditionally foraged. They, when they were put in, these were hot spots of foraging activity. Um, and so 13 hydro stations, that's a lot of data to look at. So we're gonna look at data from these four in particular um, that I've outlined in blue circles, because we found that the data from these four hydro stations is actually representative of the whole system. Uh, so 
But once again, we don't have a tide station, so we have to look at this data through a different lens. We can't just look at mean sea level. That's, that's not possible with these hydro stations. So instead, the lens and the tool that we use to look at this is something called the prey concentration threshold, or PCT. So the PCT describes a drawdown effect in the mangrove coastal zone of Florida Bay that effectively concentrates prey for foraging by wading birds. So if we look at this aerial image here on the left, um, you can ignore the zero in the 100. We do see uh, lots of mangroves. We see this creek habitat through the middle and on either side, some flats. And it looks pretty flat overall. If you're wondering what these uh, white squares are, this is an actual aerial image of one of our, our um, sites where we have a hydro station and we do fish monitoring. So this is an actual image of one of the areas we work in. Uh, so if we were to take a snapshot, so this red line is a transect line. And if we were to take a snapshot from right in the middle in this black circle, it would look something like what we have here on the left during the wet season, or excuse me, on the right in this red circle here during the wet season. Now there's good water depth, there's or deep water, there's fish dispersed throughout. As we move into the dry season, we experience what's called drawdown. So the water decreases across Florida Bay. And by the end of the dry season, fish will get trapped in this creek habitat. Um, in an area of low water. And so that's the same amount of energy is still available as during the wet season and the late dry season. It's just much more accessible to birds, much easier to get. Um, I do wanna note that this is a pretty good representation of what we're looking at, but I wanna give you another way of thinking about this. So if we were to take this aerial image, for example, and look straight up down on it using a bird's eye view, it might look something like this cartoon image I put together. You have some high areas where you have mangroves sticking up. Um, you've got lots of water during the wet season, fish dispersed throughout. During peak dry season, it may look something more like this. You still have your creek habitat and there are fish concentrated in that creek habitat, but you also have uh, these green areas which are dried out. But these areas are not flat, they're not. They have pockets where fish and water will get trapped all over them. And this is great for use by wading birds. It's really easy for them to get enough food this way. Uh, and we have repeatedly measured this effect, or Jerry Lorenz, who uh, has been working on this for years, has repeatedly measured this, this drawdown effect and was able to determine that the prey concentration threshold for the mangrove coastal zone in Florida Bay is 13 centimeters. So that's pretty similar to, for example, the max depth that spoonbills can forage at, which is 20 centimeters. So now that we kind of understand this prey concentration threshold, let's take a look at that data from those four hydro stations, uh, those four representative hydro stations. So on the x-axis, we have years. And on the y-axis, we have days below the PCT. So the number of days per year on average that were below the prey concentration threshold, water levels were below that at these hydro stations. And uh, so from 1990 to about 2022, uh, you can see from these trend lines, what we do see is a general downward trend in the number of days on average that the water was below 13 centimeters. Um, so why is this important? Well, I guess I should say first, so until about, um, I believe it's, until about 2011, uh, until 2011, we had about 75 to 100 days per year on average where uh, water levels were below the prey concentration threshold. So prey was very easy to access. Uh, post 2011, so post about uh, right here, 
it drops to less than 50 days a year. In the last four years, this trend has become even more noticeable. Where only one site, uh, this site in blue here, has exceeded 25 days a year um, below the prey concentration threshold on average. And so I want to connect this back to sea level rise because you may be saying, that's great, that's the prey concentration threshold, uh, it's decreasing, but what does that have to do with sea level rise? Well, water flow into the bay would not change uh, prey concentration threshold. This has to do with the amount of, uh, with sea level rise impacting water levels across the bay and increasing water depth. So causing there to be fewer days uh, with uh, low water. So I also want you to think about uh, what a spoonbill is supposed to do. And on average from uh, hatch to fledge, it takes about 50 days for a spoonbill, uh, from hatch to fledge, 50 days to raise a spoonbill chick. So when you have less than 25 days a year on average, when food is really easy to get, it's really easy to acquire energy, spoonbills have to change what they're doing. So that means some of these birds, they have to think about trade-offs. So they could fly further north uh, and the greater distances to find areas where water is lower, but that's a lot longer time off the nest. And it's also more energy they as parents need to consume to feed their chicks. So we're kind of asking, well, what are spoonbills supposed to do? How are they handling this issue? Uh, what are they doing? And that's where our transmitter data can come in again. And it's starting to help us tease apart this question and begin to answer it. Um, so this is a map for a bird named Louis Trace, also named by a donor, uh, in April 2022. And so this is just one month of data. And we can see there is some use of this mangrove coastal zone, but not much. This bird was primarily using keys in Florida Bay, which I circled in blue. And we recognize these five keys in particular. So we looked into these and realized what they had in common was large interior ponds. Uh, and that made us really curious about the hydrology of these ponds. Uh, we know that historically these ponds were only flooded with rainfall events or during strong wind driven tides. They rarely supported fish communities. Um, so we wanted to know, well, spoonbills are using these areas all of a sudden, what has changed? So to, to look at this, uh, we put out six hydro stations in Florida Bay, six new hydro stations. Um, indicated by these red triangles and the blue circles, on keys that we know have large interior ponds. And uh, what this was able to tell us is that the hydrology, well, so far, some of these have only been out a year, some have been out two years, so we're still getting a lot of new data in and synthesizing it. But the, the, these ponds are staying uh, wet year round now they are connected to the bay. They are having some dry down effects, but it's not as, as much, and they're somewhat tidal. Um, so, uh, and they are fostering fish communities. Um, so we need to look into that more. So this is great news for us. We're thinking, wow, spoonbills are showing plasticity in their behavior. They're using new foraging sites. This is really cool. But we have the question, can these interior ponds actually provide enough food? That's our current question that we're working on. Um, our preliminary hypotheses, and I'll note that these are just hypotheses we're working on right now. We're gathering data to, to look into all of this. But our hypotheses are that these interior ponds most likely cannot provide enough food to support large nesting colonies of roseate spoonbills in Florida Bay and to offset that change that uh, the lack of food 
or the lack of days below the PCT in uh, uh, the mangrove coastal zone. So then what can we likely expect as the future of spoonbills in Florida Bay? Well, it's not all doom and gloom, we expect. Uh, once again, a working hypothesis, uh, but we expect that we will still have spoonbills in Florida Bay, maybe not in high numbers, and that spoonbills that previously nested in Florida Bay may go to other areas of the Everglades ecosystem to nest. But once again, these are educated guesses. We're still gathering data to look at these questions. And so hopefully, maybe I'll get to report back to you all later with um, more information. So I do wanna leave you with this positive note that spoonbills are changing their behavior and they're adapting and they're, they're really showing us so much that we didn't know about them. Um, but with that, I would like to thank all of our staff, our collaborators, our funders, partners, volunteers, everyone who has made this work possible. It's a joint effort It's uh, that has taken much longer than the several years I've been with Audubon to complete this work. Um, and so many, many people have made it possible. So I, I want to thank you all for taking the time uh, this evening to listen to me ramble on about spindles in Florida Bay. And they'll note I've put our email up or my email up here, um, as well as a link to our chap our webpage, our center's webpage, and um, our Facebook page. So maybe not the most active Facebook page. And I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you all. I have a question to Emily. Mm -hmm. Are they surveying um, spoonbill nesting areas and other sites too? Yes, so there is spoonbill monitoring that goes on throughout Florida um, at multiple sites, uh, but we are just responsible for Florida Bay, but they are looking at it elsewhere in Florida and monitoring large colonies, for example, in the water conservation areas. Okay. I see someone has their hand up, Alex. Hi. Um... Before I say anything, just like excellent presentation, by the way, you crushed it. Thank you. Um, so my question was, when you guys go to do your camera placement for nest monitoring, are you worried that that might incite um, some chance of nest failure? Yeah, so that is something we have thought about. Um, and so these cameras are actually placed uh, three to six feet away from a nest. They're not right near a nest and we do it um, we try and do it during a late incubation stage or a very early young chick stage because that's the point at which they have a very strong attachment to their nest. If we were to do this when they were just starting to lay their eggs, they don't have as strong an investment in their nest. So we avoid those time periods if we find a nest that's just being laid. Thank you. Uh, we do have a question from Laura. Do the movement locations change according to spoonbill age? And then an, on a side, how long do they live? Yeah, so those are both great questions. And we are just sort of looking into uh, what I would refer to almost as migratory patterns of spoonbills. Um, I hesitate to use that term fully, but uh, Spoonbill movement, it may change with age. Unfortunately, we've mostly had transmitters on uh, adult birds. So we haven't, we would love to see what some of these sub-adults before they breed, since they do mature at four, three to four years of age um, and breed at that time, what they're doing, um, where they're going. We have some indication that, uh, well, we don't really actually at this point. But we're working on that. We do want to know if there is some difference in age. We're, the biggest trend that we're seeing now is that individuals are very consistent in their movement, but we're not seeing a consistent pattern between um, all adults or all juveniles, for example. And then the second part of that question, I'm sorry, could you repeat the second part, Susan? How long do they live? Yes. As of right now, I think our oldest recorded spoonbill 
in the wild, and I may not have this 100% correct, was at least 18 years old oh. um, based on banned recites. But we suspect they are a fairly long-lived bird, considering that they don't reach sexual maturity until three to four years of age. How does that compare to like, um, like great egrets? Uh, I think it's, uh, I, I don't know exactly. I, I know wood storks. I think the spoonbills are probably a little more similar in age structure to wood storks with, um, I believe wood storks have been documented living to like uh, 22, 25. That's uh, more what I would expect with the spoonbills. I think they share a lot of similarities there because those birds also don't mature until four years of age. Oh, okay. But once again, I, I'm speaking off the cuff here. I don't have data to back that up. <laughs> it's okay. Any other questions? I have one, not total um, topic. How do you, when you're out there, how, um, do you have to deal with like alligators, crocodiles, things like that when you're up there trying to get to these nests? Yeah, so Florida <laughs> Bay is um, full of all kinds of interesting creatures. It is a shark nursery, so we deal with a lot of sharks in the water, usually small, very small, like lemon sharks and such. So they're more afraid of you than you are of them usually. Um, crocodiles are definitely something we see. We don't have, um, I haven't had any real run-ins with crocodiles. I don't go up into the freshwater areas on mainland Everglades much, but there are alligators up there. So I don't see alligators much, but um, we definitely have rattlesnakes on some keys. Um, we have seen pythons. We have other venomous snakes out there as well. So it's there's definitely, you run into all kinds of interesting creatures. So it's going to be exciting afternoon sometimes. <laughs> Occasionally, yeah. We try and keep it on the tame, exciting side. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? I think I see. Yeah, go ahead, Alex. I, I do have one. So more from the field work side of things, are there any challenges in particular that you run into that others wouldn't really consider? You know, the Everglades is a very unique environment, and it is a highly, um, we like to say that the Everglades will break everything. Uh, it's an environment that uh, is very difficult to work in. You're sometimes your salt water, sometimes your fresh water. It's hard on our boats. Um, one thing I think that people don't think about with the field work for this is uh, the amount of climbing and scrambling over obstacles that you do, and um, also the free climbing of trees. We're never going very high, but you do, to put things up in the trees, we do free climb and to put up our cameras, for example. So those are some of the challenges you might not think about. Um, some of these areas are extremely, extremely dense uh, mangroves that you have to move through. So I, I hope that answers your question. <laughs> Yeah, it does. Thank you. All right, other questions? Okay, Laura wondered, is it possible to have a drone lodged in the trees? So, I'd, Laura, are you meaning instead of putting a camera up to get a drone up there into the tree to be the, as the camera? Okay. I don't know. Have you guys thought about that? Um, yes. And uh, we have thought about the use of drones just to help with monitoring efforts, for example. But um, we are in a national park, and uh, drone usage is barred in national parks at this point in the US. Um, also, there's a lot of rules around drone usage, such as that you can't film vehicles and boats count as vehicles. So if we were, for example, uh, trying to 
work a transect with a, uh, a drone above a key and a fisherman came by on his boat, we could not take pictures while that fisherman was in view. Um, so there's, there's a lot of challenges that go in with drones. So, um, but the biggest one is that we are in a national park, so we cannot use them at this time. And Debbie wants to know, do you have to make any special arrangements during hurricane season? Um, for the birds or? We don't, we kind of let the Florida Bay do its thing during hurricanes. Um, we do a lot of securing our boats at our research station, taking boats out of the water, putting them on trailers and uh, just closing down our, our research station. So. I think that's what she meant because she put equipment, et cetera. Yeah, we spend the, if there is an incoming storm, we spend quite a bit of time prepping our building, our equipment and backing up data to take with us. Any other quick questions? Yes, how do you catch them to, to ban them? Yeah, that's that's a really uh, fun one, actually. Uh, it's a real challenge. Currently, what we're doing is we're going to known foraging sites, and we're setting up sort of a crescent of mist nets to create a barrier. Um, we put decoys out, uh, lawn flamingos, and um, we sit in a blind, and we have a CO2 net gun that we use to um, target birds when they come into range. And so we deploy the net gun if they aren't caught by that net. Uh, we're hoping that they run and hit the uh, mist nets and get tangled in the mist nets and we can grab them that way. But the only way we can really get them to come into an area is with those decoys. They're very attracted to the pink decoys. Hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? I think it's kind of cute that you guys use flamingos. Now, wait, do flamingos, are they attack, attracted to decoys? Maybe we need to put a couple out at the door. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking about that this week. Maybe we need to put some more out when we scatter them through Florida Bay. Hmm. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> 